More than 50 years ago, the U.S. government ended Project Blue Book. In 2017, we learned for the first time that the Department of Defense had quietly restarted a similar organization tracking what we now call unidentified aerial phenomena. For too long, the stigma associated with UAPs has gotten in the way of good intelligence analysis. Pilots avoided reporting or were laughed at when they did. DOD officials relegated the issue to the back room or swept it under the rug entirely. UAPs are unexplained, it's true, but they are real. They need to be investigated, and many threats they pose need to be mitigated. On today's show, David Grush will be making an appearance at the... Wait. Oh, wait, that's canceled? David Grush's long-awaited op-ed is on the way, according to both Ross Colhart and Jesse Michaels. Numerous House representatives and senators say hearings are coming. A House hearing on USOs is in the works, according to Luna. Ross Colhart and News Nation have asked to interview Dr. John McDowell, whose team is studying the Nazca mummies in Peru. And Senator Gillibrand states she's unaware the UAP amendment was gutted last year, but that she plans to have a public hearing with Arrow's new head, Tim Phillips. But in the words of Obi-Wan, this isn't the hearing you're looking for. Let's go. There's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. Intelligence representative at a high level from the US government is saying publicly, we are not alone. Greetings, beautiful people, you marvelous citizens of the planet Earth, and welcome to The Lucid Lens, uh, where we cover the biggest story in human history. Uh, UFOs, now called UAP, where the U.S. government over the last several years has repeatedly admitted that UFOs are real. If you're new to the channel and you enjoy the content, consider subscribing, leave a like, uh, but most of all, leave a comment. I want to know what your thoughts, theories, opinions are on these stories, where you are with regards to the phenomena itself. It helps, you know, reach a wider audience and, you know, feed the algorithm. I'm only doing this to raise awareness. I've got a day job. I just want more and more people to be talking about this. I mean, if I can get two people to look into this on their own and, and do some investigating, that's all I want to do. That, I feel like I've accomplished something. So help me out. Give a like. Dislike if you don't like it. That's fine, too. But really, it's it's about the comments. I want to get discussion going and, and share this, like get people to talk about it. That's really my whole whole mission here. All right. So originally, I was going to do this big segment focused on the implications of Grush speaking at the SALT conference, you know, what that could mean, diving into what the SALT conference even is, because I didn't really know about it aside from one clip with uh, Gary Nolan from last year. And it would have been pretty huge. You know, as many of you know, Gary Nolan spoke last year before he dropped a pretty big bombshell. I think the question was like, how certain are you that we've been visited by alien life? And he's like, oh, 100%. <laughs> and the interviewer, he was like, whoa. So people were kind of like, why is Grush talking to, you know, these muckety mucks? <laughs> he should be out there talking to the people and telling, up, telling us. Grush has already spoken publicly on some of the largest platforms Available to him. Remember, the big story broke on the debrief. Ross Colhart interviewed him on News Nation. He had a public hearing in the U.S. Congress. Then he did, uh, was it Jesse Michaels' American Alchemy Channel? Yes Theory. Uh, Joe Rogan podcast, the biggest podcast in the world. And then uh, I think he showed up on Tucker Carlson's show. Um, Tucker Carlson's show. Tongue twister. He's been out there publicly. Some of the biggest platforms that will, you know, have him on. If you're asking, why isn't he showing up on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News? Well, then you're asking the right questions. Um, but we know one thing is for certain. The op-ed is coming. So Ross Colhart in his uh, recent AMA on Reddit said that, yeah, the op-ed is coming. Pretty straightforward. Jesse Michaels went into a bit more detail on the Big Thing podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago. Let's go take a listen. Sort of tough. What about that op-ed? That op-ed are you supposed to? Yeah. Where, where's that? Um... I don't know exactly, but it's, uh, yeah. I know a little more than I can say, Fair. but, okay. um, it, it's, uh, you know, I think it's going to come out, okay. Um, okay. but yeah, it's one of these things where some of these publications are, it's really absurd. Like they, uh, it's, it's so clear that they are run by Intel yeah. and like, just have like a, a clear, a priori bias towards like, we will, we just won't publish anything sort of pro disclosure at this point. Yeah, that's back to the, that's back to my thing with the, with the news networks. Yeah. Yeah, right. So it sounds like Grush 
you know, it's already gone through the Dopster process. The op-ed is ready and, and complete and already being, you know, shopped around or in, or in the hands of some big publications. You know, but as Jesse pointed out, many of them are reluctant to run this story. You know, maybe they're dragging their feet and they want to do more research to get more confirmation, but, but it's an opinion piece. It's an op-ed. So maybe they're just, you know, worried about their reputation, which I get it, especially, you know, the, the print publications, you know, for, for better or for worse, a lot of people still look to these things as their source of truth. So if something doesn't show up in their paper of choice, the Washington Post, New York Times, whatever, they, they don't think it's real. It needs to show up on the nightly news because, you know, there's a big chunk of people that that's where they get their information from. That's where they're, you know, they're, they're, they're told you're allowed to believe in this because we're showing it on this mainstream channel, right? So, uh, but one thing's for certain, it can't be on the debrief again. It needs to be a mainstream publication. So I don't know if there's like maybe a bidding war going on behind the scenes. Um, but one thing we got to remember is Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp mentioned on, uh, it might've been an episode of Weaponized. And I think they were talking about the op-ed and they said something like, they, they hinted, oh, what if there was something bigger we could do with it or whatever that means. And that, that's kind of where they left it. And I'm like... So with all of this into account, what could that be? Maybe a maybe a sixty minutes uh, segment. Remember they did one on Fravor and the the, the whole Nimitz incident uh, a few years back. I mean that would be pretty huge. Maybe that would coincide with you know an actual you know drop in a, in a print publication. I don't know. It's got to be big though. It can't just be. Uh, I mean, no offense to the debrief. I love them. They do some great work. But for those folks that still look to these mainstream publications for their source of truth and what uh, that where they're told what they're allowed to believe in, it, it's going to need to be something like that in order to capture the mind share of you know that general public that still isn't like doing their own research into this stuff, right? So uh, yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, it, it sounds like the op-ed's done. It's just we're just going to get surprise dropped one day. You know, is it going to be a, a 60 Minutes episode? Is it going to be a you know New York Times piece or another publication? What do you guys think? All right. Now we're going to take a trip over to Ask a Poll where Matt Laszlo is doing the hard work. I mean, he's got a, so many good clips. Um, so this week, there's a lot going on. And, and the through line through everything is that more hearings are coming. So let's take a trip over to Eric Burleson first and see what he has to say. What may you call it? That, and in addition, you know, in reflecting on what was not said, there's still a lot of questions. Yeah. So, Ber like one of them was, a, I think I mentioned this to you, is that when Birch had asked about some of the data, they saw that they had not received data from, yeah. from the Navy. That's pretty just alarming that it's been over a year. Yeah. They've, you know, Arrow is not getting all the information that they, I mean, they said that in general, they are most of all the other agencies are cooperating, but at the end of the day, they're not getting some of it. So I think that I'd like to, um, I don't know, I'd, I'd like to hear from, from your community what steps they think yeah. would be the, the best steps to take next. Uh, Do you feel like you were misrepresented in what you told us? leaving there or that we misrepresented you in uh, what I'm look I think I've been consistent like my yeah. my attitude is I'm gonna be a skeptic until you can prove till you can show me I'm a yeah. Missouri I'm gonna be that way and I walked out of that room they didn't they didn't they, there was nothing and I didn't anticipate that they yeah. would but I do think so I was, if anything I think that there was quite a few things that we've sightings that we've seen that have made it made their way to the public that they were able to, able to, to dispel huh. to me in such a way that I feel feel fairly certain that they're probably right but, and in better ways than they've done publicly yeah and to and to I, you know one of my friends who is in the UAP he's a he's a UFO what do you call him ufologist yeah he said and I I tend to agree with him is that Probably the vast majority of this of the photos and videos, the vast majority are fake. Yeah. Or are photos of things that are not necessarily UAP. Yeah. And so that being said, I think that 
Arrow is not done. They still have some stuff to do. And, and I, I don't think that our job should be done either. And at the end of the day, we still have dark programs that are spending money that we don't have an answer for. But well, that's been the interesting thing with LA. They've been like, look, we answered the questions on it. It's 500 that we can identify. And it's like, no one cares about those. Yeah. <laughs> what are the other ones? Well, and what and I would on the say, Senate side, what I would is, say yeah. is, like, in general, like, I'm going to continue to go about it the way that I, I am. But I think that what that does, what I, what, it, what it does do is for, for the community is that a guy, I think that you guys want a guy like me. Because at the end of the day, uh, I, I'm going to shoot you straight. And if I see something that changed my worldview, you're gonna know. Yeah. And and people will Ryan. hopefully find that with credibility. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, thousand percent. So he says there's no cases from the Navy being sent to Arrow, which is interesting. Uh, and that's where the videos came from before, right? Those were Navy videos. So that I find that interesting that Arrow is essentially calling out the Navy when it seems like it's been the other branches that have been hiding stuff. But I think there could be some potential infighting between military branches where if one kind of, you know, remember the air force wasn't a thing. It was part of the army until right after Roswell, I believe was when the time that that was created and it kind of spun off and maybe they kind of took control of some stuff along with, you know, the creation of the CIA um, so maybe the Navy felt left out and maybe they're, tr I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm reading too much into that, but it's, that, that was pretty interesting. Um, so he says, that, you know, he's Burleson's looking for input from the community, which is interesting. I mean, that's pretty humble of him to be like, look, pe people have been studying this stuff for years, decades. Like they know a lot more than we do. We're just being brought up to speed and it's, you know, on top of the dozens of other issues they're dealing with. So he's open to, you know, uh, in, input from the community. Um, he's got a ufologist friend, which I thought was pretty interesting. But he says Arrow's job isn't done. At the end of the day, there are still dark programs spending money that they don't have an answer for. Which, yeah, uh, that I think is the angle that these guys just need to take. And while not every congressperson will or should be read into every, you know, special access program, I mean, their special access for a reason, right? There is, you know, legitimate um, programs that, you know, with conventional programs that we want to be, remain a secret, right? But at the end of the day, like, if these UAP programs exist, who the fuck cares about conventional programs, right? I mean, this is like, you, just, you throw all that out. So... Anyway, very interesting. Um, I'm glad to see he's still following up. And he, and he points out that he's he's a skeptical person. And I admire that. And that's those are the type of people we need. We don't need people who jump to conclusions one way or the other. We need people who are just taking in as much information. That's what a smart person does. You take in all the information. You don't throw anything out, as ridiculous as it might sound. And you just follow the evidence and see where it leads. So I like Burleson. I'm really uh, happy that he's uh, got that open mind. So uh, next, we're going to take a trip to Mike Gallagher, who uh, is a former uh, member of the House Intelligence Committee. And uh, I'm going to include a surprise with this one. Uh, it's curious. Who was that? I asked you about the UAP issue. It was interesting about the Senate side. We thought Kim Kane brought it up. From generals. Of course, just in town. Mark Kelly just brought it up about Luke Air Force Base. Oh, well, yeah. Kane was bringing it up about Langley. Jillibrand was just that bad if said there was incursions, like regular incursions, that she just briefed on the class side portion of her uh, trip. Yeah, it I seems know. like there's just a steady, like, oh, should we be worried? Should we be worried about well, I still, I still don't think we have, like, a good oh. explanation for, like, what's fouling or ranges. I haven't heard one. Yeah. And um, that's just a matter of safety for our pilots and furthermore like I don't I don't think we have a well enough established process for just like cataloging incidents like analyzing all the data and storing it in the right way like um, I still think era has a long way to go yeah in that respect 
as well. Well, that's what's so. interesting when they just dropped their recent declassified report. They made it sound very definitive, <laughs> and yet, yeah, there's still a lot of incursions and a lot of frustration with you members. Um, what yeah, we, I, I share that frustration. What can be done to dislodge them? Try to stick uh, or whip them into shape. That's a nice tease. <laughs> so, I said, yeah, you chat. He, he, he says, yeah, do you hear this man? Uh, sorry, go ahead. I was just asking, what can be done to whip them into shape? Well, I think more, like, more hearings were good. I think the hearing that we did yeah. last year, like, was, was, it was very snooky. I got a ton of attention. And it just showed that Congress, like, cared about the issue and wasn't afraid to talk about it. Right? Yeah. That one doesn't want to be labeled a kooky alien nut. Um, so more of that, just, like, standard yeah. flexing the oversight muscles. And there's just not been a follow-up because of all the other stuff. No, I mean, we've been doing stuff. Yeah. Um, I had a, had a variety of um, amendments and whatnot, but I think yes. this would be another issue that will be um, addressed in some fashion in, in this year's NDAA. Yeah. So he, he says there's no good explanation of what's fouling our ranges. Concerned about pilot safety, you know, they've done a poor job cataloging and analyzing data of incidents. And, and he's, you know, thinks more hearings will move the needle. But then... Interestingly enough, he said, we need to do more to address the issue in this year's NDAA, which I was like, wow, that's like the first time I've heard a uh, um, you know, Congress member bring that up recently, right? Uh, so he he's saying all the right things here, which makes me think he's got a pretty good understanding of the situation as a whole. And remember, he's a former member of the House Intelligence Committee, so he's pretty well read in on things. And if he's not satisfied with Arrow's explanations or the Pentagon's stance as a whole, that's pretty telling. And for a reminder, here's a clip of him from the House Intelligence Committee hearing from 2022. A hearing I think many uh, have overlooked or forgotten about since it's become kind of you know overshadowed by last year's hearing with Grush, Fravor, and Graves. But this hearing still contains some valuable uh, testimony and it really just showed the interest and awareness and determination uh, in members of Congress to get some answers. Let's take a listen. To join this hearing, um, I really appreciate uh, the witness's testimony. Um, Mr. Moultrie, as the chairman uh, mentioned, uh, DOD had an initiative to study UFOs in the 1960s called Project Blue Book. It's also been well reported in our briefing and in, in other places that we have more, have more recent projects, specifically uh, ATIP. Could you describe any other initiatives that the DOD or DOD contractors have managed after Project Blue Book ended and prior to ATIP beginning? Did anything also predate Project Blue Book? It's also been reported uh, that there have been UAP observed uh, and interacting with and flying over sensitive military facilities, particularly, and not just ranges, but uh, some facilities housing our strategic nuclear forces. Uh, one such incident allegedly occurred uh, uh, at Malmstrom Air Force Base, in which 10 of our nuclear ICBMs were rendered inoperable. At the same time, a glowing red orb was observed overhead. I'm not commenting on the accuracy of this. I'm simply asking you whether you're aware of it and whether you have any comment on the accuracy of that report. Let me pass that to Mr. Bray. If you've been looking at the UAPs over the last uh, three years. Uh, that data is not uh, within the holdings of the UAP task force. Okay. But are you aware of the, the report or that the data exists somewhere? I have uh, I have heard stories. I have not seen the official data on that. So you've just seen informal stories, no official assessment that you've done or exists within DOD that you're aware of uh, regarding the Malmstrom incident? Uh, all I can speak to is, you know, what's within my cognizance of the UAP task force, and we have not looked at that incident. Well, I, would say, I mean, it's a pretty high-profile incident. Uh, I, I don't claim to be an expert on this, but that's out there in the ether. You're, you're the guys investigating it. I mean, if, who else is doing it? If something was officially brought to our attention, we would look at it. Uh, there are many things that are out there in the ether that aren't officially brought to our attention. So how would it have to be officially brought to your You'll attention? I'm bringing it to your attention. Sure, so, <laughs> this is pretty official. Sure. So we'll go back and take a look at it, but generally there is some um, authoritative figure that says there is an incident that occurred. We'd like you to look at this. Uh, but in terms of just tracking what may be in the media that says that something occurred at this time, at this place, uh, there are probably a lot of leads that we would have to follow up on. I don't think we are resourced to do that right now. Well, I don't claim to be an authoritative figure, but for what it's worth, I would like you to look in, into it. And sure. If for another reason you could dismiss it and say this is not worth 
wasting resources on. Well um, and then finally, are, are you aware of a document that appeared around uh, 2019, uh, sometimes called the Admiral Wilson Memo or EW Notes Memo? I am, I am, I am not. You're not. Are you trying? I'm not personally aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a document in which, again, I'm not commenting on the veracity. Uh, I was hoping you would help me with that, in which a former uh, head of DIA claims mm -hmm. to have had a conversation with the Dr. Eric Wilson uh, and claims to have uh, sort of been made aware of certain um, contractors or, or DOD programs um, that he tried to get uh, fuller access to and was denied uh, access to. Um, so you're not aware of that? I'm not aware, Congressman. Uh, in my 10 seconds remaining, then, I, I guess I just would ask Mr. Chairman unanimous consent to enter that memo into the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. So Gallagher went really hard on them, um, you know, asking, do you know about any other secret programs that may have occurred between Blue Book and ATIP? Interestingly enough, they left out OSAP, but I don't think OSAP was... I think it was still kind of in the shadow of ATIP, even though ATIP was what was really in the shadow of OSAP. It's just weird how they brought that forward, but I know why they did it. But anyway, so, but then the bigger thing was like, did you guys investigate the uh, Maelstrom incident? No. Why not? You need my permission to tell, like, you need someone to ask you to uh, investigate one of the like most well-known cases like we in the public know about of a nuclear launch facility getting infiltrated and our 10 of our nukes getting turned off? You need someone to tell you to investigate that? What the fuck are you investigating if not that? Like, holy shit, guys. Like, what are you doing? Like, I love that he called them out on this. He's like, all right, you now have my permission to go investigate that. Like, holy crap. I love that he called them out. And like, if you guys haven't watched the uh, this hearing, it's it's pretty good. I mean, definitely, definitely watch it at least once. Um, and, and I included a clip uh, in the beginning uh, of the video of, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Carson, his opening address, which I, I think just kind of sets the stage for, for how this subject, you know, has been treated and, and where the government's stance on it is now. It's like we're acknowledging this and we need this needs to be safe for people to come forward and share their experiences so we can figure out what it is. So I love that's where, where we're at. And this was two years ago, remember. So things things have been moving forward whether we see that progress in the public or not. Um, so yeah, I'm sad to hear that Gallagher isn't running for re-election because he like, he's pretty like locked in on this and uh, I haven't really looked into why he's not running for re-election. It could just be, you know, for personal reasons or, or whatever. Maybe he wants to do other things, but I hope he isn't like, isn't getting pushed out because he's like too on the money with something, but you never know. All right, next up, let's go to Luna and see what she's got to say about an upcoming USO hearing. How are you, ma'am? Hi, what's going on? I don't know, you tell me. What, with the MTG, the motion to vacate next week. I don't think it's going to go anywhere, to be honest with you. Yeah, not feeling it? Well, it's, it, yeah, there's, I don't think so. Any update on UAP hearing? Um, we're working on doing something with USO, so we're talking to some people. Cool, cool. How you doing? Well, that was short and sweet. <laughs> so she's working on doing something with USOs and we're talking to some people. So does that mean they're going to have a hearing? Uh, and this is going to be in the House Oversight again, because that's where she is. Um, solely focused on USOs. Um, I mean, that could definitely help broaden the, the scope and perspective and raise awareness of just how widespread uh, this phenomenon actually is. I mean, it's a, it's multi-domain, right? It's space, air, and sea, and I guess land too. Just that alone will get more attention. Um, the mainstream. I mean, I didn't know about USOs. That that's that was new to me over the last you know six seven months or so. Um, so I think that alone will get more attention. But they need to go further with the witnesses because that's really what it's going to come down to: is who are the witnesses that they're going to bring forward to testify, uh, and it's going to come down to how impactful that testimony is. Is one of those people perhaps, uh, you know, Tim Gallaudet? Is he going to appear as a po possible witness? I mean, maybe. I mean, remember, while he's not an insider um, or a firsthand witness, he has spoken to people who are in these programs, and he was also has also spoken to, uh, you know, Navy personnel who have had experiences and, and interactions and, 
um, various events, but also he uh, was there when the GoFast video was emailed through the private Navy channel to all the top command, and then it was wiped from their emails the next day. So, I mean, he's a very credible, highly respected official that does have experience. So I think that could lend credibility to other stories, um, you know, just based on what he's heard and experienced and his position. I mean, he what he says carries a lot of weight. So, but I don't think he'll be the only witness, right? There's got to be more. So, while and while he, him alone might not, you know, move the needle for us who already know about him and pay attention to everything he's said, many of Congress probably don't. And the public at large probably doesn't, right? He hasn't been out there as, as wide as like a David Grush, who, who probably has reached more people, right? So I think um, having him there will definitely perk some ears up and open up new avenues for investigation. But besides the former, you know, rear admiral, we need some firsthand witness testimony. And maybe Navy personnel that was on a ship during an event. Um, but I think more, even more so is we need to get a program insider as well, as that's really what's going to push things forward. But at the end of the day, I don't know if House Oversight Committee hearings are the venue that is really going to push this forward. I feel like it's going to be, you know, maybe Senate hearings will have hold a little bit more weight, but... And then it, it's going to come down to the quality of the witnesses, right? If we do get another, you know, David Grush or, or 10 coming through that venue, then, you know, that will definitely capture more attention. Um, but I think really it's going to be, you know, stronger legislation. They're going to have to build on the NDAA, which we know is happening. We know there's a new version or a reinforcement to that um, legislation that's already with Senate. So, um yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be a combination of everything. P- people like me talking to you know people to raise awareness, grassroots style. We got all the different groups out there raising awareness. We got Senate and, and Congress; they're all working on stuff. I mean, it's going to be all of us just openly talking and and digging together. It's what's going to raise awareness. It's going to bring out you know stuff. Legislation's going to you know allow it to come forward, and it's this going to be a lot of legal uh, battles going on with contractors and um, definitely some infighting between, you know, government agencies and, and all it's going to get messy, I think, but that's how it's going to have to come out. All right. So with that down, let's go now to Senator uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, who um, also had a, quite a few things to say. Did you met with Timothy Phillips at the Arrow? Could you the interim director for the staff? Yes, I did. How'd that go? Very well. Um, yeah. I think he's incredibly competent. He was working with uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick uh, all along. Um, I've, I let him know that I'd like to have a public hearing this summer. Oh. And so he's going to put together um, some data and information mm-hmm. to disclose in a public hearing to show what work they've done, especially examples of things that were unknown that they've been able to figure out mm-hmm. and examples of things that were unknown that they still haven't figured out so that the public can see the difference between what technology brings to this analysis um, to inform lawmakers on what we need to do. Um, I also uh, am working on more legislation to require more sensors so that we have more data collection of the area between FAA space requirement, FAA and space. Um, That number of miles of airspace um, isn't really looked at. Interesting. Well enough. I also have deep concerns about some of the um, presence of drones around our military base. Um, that is deeply concerning that they are spyware by adversaries, and so you want to have more information on that as well. So, I'm looking for a lot more information and work on these topics um, because I think that it is really concerning for domain awareness, for national security, and for pilot safety. It's interesting. their declassified report kind of made it feel like case closed. But so you want Oh, it's definitely present? not case closed. Yeah. I think the, the their report was just that their analysis of everything they were shown and everyone they talked to, they had no basis to say there's a secret program. Yeah. Um, but of note, the two whistleblowers that I've met with did not meet with Arrow and refused to meet with Arrow. 
And so maybe the next director they'll meet with, but I can't assess them unless Arrow can talk to them. Yeah. Because they don't. I mean, Arrow knows what they know and what they've been, what they've seen and what they've been shown. Have you met David Grush yet? Um, no. We invited him to yeah. come, uh, and we and I was supposed to meet with him and Dr. Kirkpatrick together, but they ultimately declined that yeah. thing. Interesting. Yeah. I'll keep so, my ears out for the hearing this summer. Yeah, so we're going to try to do something this summer to just, again, keep the public aware mm -hmm. of where we are, what we know, what we don't know, mm -hmm. and then and how we're going to gather data from here going forward that, so we have more robust information. Yeah. Interesting. Have you heard anything about people at the Pentagon, like Jake Sullivan and Lloyd Austin, working to kind of gut the Schumer, your amendment last year, and the NDAA issue? I did not hear about that. Um, no. I think... It was very important that the way the amendment was worded, that it didn't disclose SAPs related to U.S. space programs. Interesting. I think it was much more about let's frame this the right way so that we're not disclosing programs that we don't think should ever be made public. Interesting. Um, that had nothing to do with um, yes, they have a the, an issue of concern on identified area phenomena. Because they've never had these conversations or had to release it. Right. I think it was maybe just worded too broadly. So I think there were, if there was any effort, it was to just make sure it disclosed UAP-specific things. Any work on that amendment for this NDA? Uh, the required disclosure? Uh, yeah, or expanding it. Or... I don't know. I thought we passed the provisions of that amendment. Yeah, but some people, if they increase it up a House Congressional UAP caucus, they... Wow. They want to have a different Support. version of it? I'll, I'll take a so. look at whatever. I thought we passed what what we were hoping to pass. Well, the Obama police say shoot. Or your amendment was shoot. Mine's really different. Water. Yeah. 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 I thought Chuck got done what he wanted to get done. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken. Mm -hmm. I, I thought he accomplished what he wanted. The work I want to keep doing is to have much more thorough um, data collection because we are still seeing so many unidentified aerial phenomena and we don't know what they are. Yeah. And that's very frustrating. It's and, terrifying. And it, it, it's terrifying from, from a national security perspective and just for these pilots to have to fly and, and do their jobs to not be safe and to not know what they're running up against. And I'm just very worried about technology that we're not aware of, particularly if it's from an adversary that's doing it for a malign interest, whether it's Russia, China, Iran, or others. It's very important. Great. So, thank you. Run. It's you now. So she has faith in this new director of Arrow, Timothy Phillips. Um, she wants a new hearing with him. And this is going to be um, with uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee, like she had the hearing last year. Early, I think it was in April, which another hearing that was kind of overshadowed. Um, but and this was just a a hearing with uh, Sean Kirkpatrick, who basically brought a presentation to, to share what they've done. Um, you know, the methods they're using and, and what they've already been able to, you know, uh, achieve and catalog and assess and some of the cases they've already gone through and they brought examples and they showed, um, you know, trends and graphs and all this sorts of stuff that we've seen before. Um, but that was the first time we actually saw a lot of that stuff. So anyway, uh, she wants more sensor legislation. You know, there's a domain awareness gap with, um, both FAA and, and between space, you know, she's concerned about the drone presence around our bases. Yeah. But she, she very clearly says this is not case closed with regards to the arrow report. When, um, Matt Laszlo asked her about it, she's like, Oh, definitely not case closed. And arrow has no basis to say these alleged programs exist because they only know what they're told. I mean, she's very like skirting the line. Like, uh, we know that Arrow only has Title Ten clearance, and they're not really, and that's why Grush didn't go talk to them because they're not cleared. They say they're, oh, you can tell us anything, but they're not cleared. He, it's a honeypot. Like they're they're trying to lure people in because, say for instance, one of these programs is embedded in a legitimate program. If you expose that legitimate program, well, shit, you're getting uh you're you're getting your hand slapped or, or worse right and it's very i think they've done a very sophisticated intricate way of hiding these things where if you expose something then you're going to get in trouble because you exposed a legitimate program they're gonna like oh no you're not we weren't supposed to talk about that program so i i think they've got a very very um uh, intricate system set up to to trap these people 
um, in, in which is why, you know, Grush has avoided going to them. And then she even said two whistleblowers refused to meet with Arrow. But then then she goes in, she says she didn't hear about the gutting of the Schumer Amendment, um, said that they were potentially worried about exposing non-UAP programs, which is like what I just said. If these some of these UAP programs are embedded within a legitimate program, I mean, it's like a Russian, uh, Russian nesting doll situation where there's multiple programs kind of hidden and like you can't expose the top program because it's classified and you don't have access to it. But they're saying you can talk about UAP programs, but, but by doing so, you expose everything else that they're hidden with them. So it's like a catch-22. Um, so, you know, she thought that maybe it was worded too broadly. I thought we passed it. I thought Chuck passed what he wanted. And she's really concerned about more about data collection. Like, I, and I, I love that Laszlo asked her about this. But I wish that he called out the specific parts of the Schumer UAP uh, Disclosure Act that were removed, particularly the, the board uh, with subpoena power and eminent domain. I would have loved to hear her response to that because if it was, oh, but we didn't want to expose, you know, non-UAP programs, the wording was very specific. But then again, if those, not, if those UAP programs are hidden within non-UAP programs you're kind of like stuck, but so, but, but the language was very specific. It said UAP programs. So they could have redacted non UAP stuff, you know, top level stuff, still sent that over, you know, to the archives and then the classified stuff, not for public consumption would have to go through the board. So we're only looking at, you know, the board would be what? It was like the nine people, I think. And maybe it was a 10th person overseeing the chairman. I, I can't remember exactly. But but they, remember, they were funded too. I think they had like a 20-something million dollar uh, budget. And they would have a staff as well. So that staff would also be read in. But how many people are we talking about? More than they would care to admit? I don't know. There's millions of people that have classified uh, clearance already in the country. So what, what's what's a few dozen more? But... But yeah, the trend with all these elected officials is that hearings are coming. It sounds like we'll have at least one in the House and uh, the UAP caucus is setting up um, with the USOs. And then uh, one in the Senate Armed Service Committee, you know, with Gillibrand, which will be focused on Aero. So, you know, remember Sean Kirkpatrick had this one last year, early in the year where, um, you know, he, he shared what Arrow has been up to, what they're doing, and he, and he shared some now familiar graphs. Let's take a quick look. What you'll see on the left is a histogram of all of our reported sightings as a function of altitude. So most of our sightings occur in the 15 to 25,000 foot range, and that is ultimately because that's where a lot of our aircraft are. On the far right upper corner, you'll see a breakout of the morphologies of all of the UAP that are reported. Over half, about 52% of what's been reported to us are round orb spheres. The rest of those break out into all kinds of different other shapes. The gray box is uh, Essentially, there is no data on what its shape is. Either it wasn't reported or the uh, sensor did not collect it. The bottom uh, map is a heat map of all reporting areas across the globe that we have available to us. What you'll notice is that there is a heavy, what we call, collection bias, both in altitude and in geographic location. That's where all of our sensors exist. So Arrow isn't going to definitively, you know, make any declarations one way or another. I think they're just there to string us along uh, and confuse people, really. They're going to make it ambiguous enough that people continue to argue over semantics uh, of the language they choose to use. But at the end of the day, we know they only have Title 10 clearance and they work for the DOD. So maybe we'll get some more pretty graphs and trends and, and so a couple of new cases to look at and argue over. She said they're going to bring some uh, some resolved cases and then some examples of unresolved cases. And so we could see the difference between the two. The difference is going to be lack of data, I'm telling you right now. And that brings us to our main story today. Uh, so just a few weeks ago, American scientists traveled to Peru 
and began their preliminary study of the Nazca mummies, or specimen as Dr. John McDowell likes to call them. So if you remember, their initial findings were that they believe these are indeed real specimen, and they, he came out later to clarify that. They're not making any determination of what they are, what kind of specimen, but they're real specimen nonetheless. That means a real creature that was not fabricated, whatever it is, it's real. Real what? I don't know, but, but he's saying it's a real thing. So they're not making any determination, right? And that's, that's incredibly fascinating. Not only did that capture you know, my attention and a lot more people who were on the fence about this story, but seemingly that of Ross Coldhart in News Nation. Let's take a listen or read the subtitles if you don't speak Spanish. Nos va a dar una información que por ahí escuché muy interesante. Este, Joe McDowell en aquel momento que estuvo con usted en Perú hizo unas declaraciones aparte de la de la conferencia, se hizo viral esta semana la que vamos a ver a continuación subtitulada y ya llegó hasta las los investigadores de Estados Unidos y precisamente ayer Ross Colhart nos mandó un WhatsApp donde posiblemente News Nation ya jale o entreviste después de tanto conflicto que han tenido con la investigación latina desean la presencia de, de John McDowell por fin van a reconocer la en cierta parte las declaraciones lo cual demuestra de la enorme discriminación que hacia, hacia, los hacia, hacia los latinos o hacia todo aquello que no sea de ciertos países no los de habla inglesa pues, todos los europeos Australia Nueva Zelanda eh, Canadá, Estados Unidos, fuera de ellos, pues no hay nadie. ¿no? Así es, se está viendo y bueno, vamos bueno, a escuchar. Bueno, que lo hagan, ojalá que lo hagan y que... Y que, Pero eso, y que involucre jalar también a los demás investigadores, como ojalá. el doctor Salce y ustedes, ojalá. todos los no, que han estado involucrados hagan, en todo esto. Que lo hagan con el doctor McDowell. El señor McDowell va a tener sus reservas, va a decir que apenas los investigó, que está dispuesto a investigarlos, que los cuerpos son reales, y eso es lo más importante, que demuestra que el Ministerio de Cultura no dijo la verdad. So this could be pretty huge. If uh, News Nation and Ross Colhart could bring credibility to this case, we could be looking at a monumental shift in the tone uh, of the narrative here in the States, or at least the English-speaking world. Uh, while I start to see more people you know, publicly taking the case seriously, at least in the UAP space, uh, the public at large, without a doubt, has moved on from this as it's gotten just horrible coverage uh, in the English-speaking world. You know, as Jaime Musan pointed out, there's a bit of racial discrimination, uh, seemingly, but that seems to be largely around this specific case of the Nazca mummies. While, you know, the unveiling at the hearing overshadowed nearly everything else at that public hearing, there was interesting video uh, and testimony, but this is the only thing that got slammed. Nothing else got discredited. Even though Javi Musan is the one that organized the whole thing, it was just this very specific part of it that got called out and discredited. So I don't think it's as much of a racial or language issue, uh, but just the very nature of what this case is. We've got real physical bodies that look like they're straight out of Close Encounters and we have Jaime Musan's involvement, which made this a very easy target for, for debunkers and, and people who want to discredit and shit all over the story. So, I, I mean, at the end of the day, if this story gets some serious coverage in the U.S., it could really change the minds uh, of people who don't think it's a legitimate story and have already kind of moved on past it. And, you know, the memes did a great job of, of making people feel at ease and like, oh, yeah, OK, it's, it's just whatever. So yeah, I'm really interested to see uh, if Ross Colhart and, and News Nation will pick this up. What will that do to you know efforts in, in the Congress in the U.S.? Well, I mean, will they just continue to ignore this stuff going on outside of the country? Probably. They're all they're you know they work for the U.S. government. They're very focused on U.S. So they're really not concerned about what's going on. But people in the know, they gotta be looking at this like. Oh, shit, man. Mexico is going to come out. They got non-human bodies. Like, I mean, our our history is like being rewritten, like as we live, like we are we are in like such a pivotal moment in time right now. Like I'll probably get into this um, in a video I'm working on that's going to kind of like 
bridge the gap from nuts and bolts UFOs to the woo and spiritual conscious side of things and what that all means and you know what what people you know like Lou and and you know Tom DeLong mean when when you know they say it's all about spirituality and consciousness. And I think a lot of the um, minutia is lost in the specific wording people choose to attach to things, but really when it comes down to it, the whole reason this is a secret is it's not because of just UFOs. It's it's much deeper than that. And and oh man, it, it's crazy that we're at like we're at like reaching the climax of so many things like happening in the world right now. And like I don't think that's like a coincidence. Like I mean, from like, you know, the threat of a World War Three and, and nuclear war and AI and just these conflicts going on around the world. And then we've got the, the whole UFO thing coming to a head right now. I mean, there is a lot of stuff going on and it's all kind of connected in a way. I mean, especially as you really dig deep into the rabbit hole of everything. Um, so, yeah, uh, I mean, what a time to be alive. But um, yeah, so what do you guys think of these stories? I'll get to that next video. I, I know I'm teasing it, but I don't know when I'll have that. It's, it's a bigger project that I'm kind of working on. But um, let me know your thoughts on, you know, Arrow's hearing that's coming. Do uh, you think we'll get any new information on that? What about the House Oversight Committee hearing on USOs? Do you think Tim Gallaudet will show up? Do you think we'll get, um, you know, firsthand witnesses, maybe program insiders there? That'll definitely help move the needle. Um, and will the English speaking world take the case of the Nazca mummies in Peru seriously? I, I think they're definitely going to need to get better English coverage for that to happen. And, and like some clarification on the, what's really gone down there. So if, if, if Ross Colhart picks this up on, on his show, then that could actually, you know, make this a legitimate case in some people's minds. So, all right, thanks for joining me today. Leave your comments down below and I'll see you on the flip side.